Hi everyone, this is Andrew Primer, Ukrainian-American, reporting from Kyiv. For today's podcast, this is week 123 of Russian invasion of Ukraine. This is the first week of July 2024. So we're going to cover a few topics. Viktor Orban arrives in Kyiv for the first time in 16 years, and after that secretly goes to Moscow to report to his boss. We're also going to talk about the ladies from the front lines and how Putin lost his last chance to win this war. So last week, Viktor Orban arrived in Ukraine for the first time since 2008, pushing the Kremlin's agenda. Prime Minister of Hungary Viktor Orban arrived in Kyiv on July 2nd for a meeting with President of, President of Ukraine Volodymyr Zelensky for the first time in 16 years. This visit took place as Hungary settles into the presidency of the Council of the European Union. Budapest has repeatedly opposed Ukraine's accession to NATO and European Union, sanctions against Russia and undermined Western efforts to assist Ukraine while maintaining close relationships with Moscow throughout the war. This has led to the deterioration of relationships between Ukraine and Hungary, which were already tense. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban continues to push the Russian agenda and urge Ukrainian President Zelensky to consider a ceasefire to accelerate the end of the war with Russia. However, Kyiv replied that it sees its own approach to the path of peace. If you remember the meaning behind the Orban's words to cease the fire, it means the land concessions to Russia and means to admit that Russia won this war. During the meeting with Orban, Zelensky said they discussed the most critical issues of neighborly relations and trade, cross-border cooperation, infrastructure, energy, humanitarian aid, and so on. But still, the relationships between uh, Ukraine and Hungary are still tense. Well, right after Kyiv's trip, Orban flew to Moscow to see his boss, Vladimir Putin. He didn't warn his Western partners about his trip, which truly irritated the West. Orban met with Putin in the Kremlin. The Hungarian Prime Minister is trying to shift the West's attention from supporting Ukraine to peaceful negotiations, what they call. But you all know these are not peaceful negotiations. He worked closely with Putin to end the war under Russia's conditions. So the Hungarian Prime Minister Orban met with the Russian President to discuss the Russian war against Ukraine and its peaceful settlement. Moscow said that Orban came not only as a partner, but a representative of the country presiding over the EU Council, which really irritated the West. Basically, Orban said that he represented the European Union, but he had no right to say that. The head of European Council and the head of European Foreign Policy emphasized that Hungary has no authority to conduct dialogue with Russia on behalf of the European Union. The head of the European Commission criticized Orban for his visit to the Russian Federation, but Orban called the trip a peaceful mission. He also stated that Hungary will soon become the only European country that can speak to all sides of the conflict. So the rare and surprising diplomatic activity of the Prime Minister of Hungary caused a real turbulence in European and U.S. politics. If these actions came as a surprise to many, it is quite obvious that Budapest has been preparing for them for a very long time. That is why today it's necessary to draw the right conclusions from the actions of Orban that already taken a place and will continue further. This will help prepare for the next surprises. So Orban's plan results from shortcomings on the Ukrainian side. The lack of real dialogue between Kyiv and Budapest has dragged on too long, and contacts in the emergency mode 
both have already not been have clearly not been enough recently. Despite half of a year of intensified contacts and preparation for a potential meeting with Orban, Zelensky still needed to find effective and convincing arguments to persuade the Hungarian side to doubt its approaches and trust in Moscow. In the diplomatic match between Ukraine and Hungary, the score is 0-2. So far, because Kyiv not only succumbed to 11 extremely dangerous conditions of Hungary in the affairs of national minorities, but also did not ensure a negative scenario of the, de- of the development of events in the Budapest contacts with Moscow. Putin used the opportunity to present to the West in the person of the country presiding of the re- over the European Union his own plan for Ukraine's surrender and the end of the war. Instead, Orban avoided any public mentions of the Ukrainian peace formula in, ro- in front of the Russian leader, condemning the aggressive war. In order to pre- preserve the principle of nothing about Ukraine with Ukraine, Kiev, sh- Kiev should receive a report on the results of Orban's conversations with Putin and use at least this opportunity to find the right words and arguments for Hungary's further actions in the interest of Ukraine, the victory and the responsibility of the aggressor. The stop in Moscow will not be the last in Orban's peacemaking tour. One can assume a desire to talk with Erdogan and Chinese president before coming to Washington for the NATO anniversary summit and presenting presenting the results of peacemaking efforts to Western leaders. Obviously, in the US, Orban will want to check his clocks with Trump. Visit to Kiev and Moscow are only the beginning of Orban's diplomatic campaign, for whom neither the role of chairman of the European Council nor signing the peace summit communique are obstacles. Orban's initiatives challenge the consolidated position of the European Union and NATO regarding support for Ukraine in isolation of the aggressor. This is another reason to activate the application of Article 7 of the Lisbon Treaty to punish Budapest and prevent similar separate actions in the future. So, Putin has two options left. What is happening on the front line in Ukraine and what is happening with the Putin circles? The fact that the front remains largely dead blocked after nearly two months of Russian attempts to advance westward can be considered an essential victory for Ukraine. Putin's best chance to make real gains on the ground has been lost and the focus on his recent diplomatic efforts suggest he is desperate to maintain his standard swaggering facade. The initiative at any level, from the tactical to strategic, supplied from his hands. Putin is no longer the master of his own destiny in any respect. He can either escalate in the hope of shocking NATO into submission, or he can insist on the inevitability of victory and carry on as before until one of the more fronts in Ukraine collapse this year or next. The bluff that he can choose the first option is necessary to maintain Putin's reflexive control over Biden, Shorts and other oligarch-loving bureaucrats who believe they run the mythical Western world. For those unfamiliar with the concept of reflex control, it is a Soviet idea taken from the USSR theory of system overload, which boils down to controlling the enemy perception of the possible. You are encouraging him to size on his worst fears about your capabilities and restrain himself. So how about the latest updates from the fronts? Front lines. Russian troops are again experimenting with striking more peaceful areas of the front. They do this periodically, 
just as local commanders changing tactics between offensive waves, sometimes sending in troops of armored vehicles, sometimes small teams of motorcycles, and occasionally making infiltration attempts. The goal is to deprive Ukraine of the stable equilibrium and, at the same time, report to the authorities that they are moving forward. In the Borova sector, between the Leman and Kupiansk fronts, on the northern flank of Ukraine's defense, the 3rd Assault Brigade reports repulsing fierce attacks. Presumably, a Russian division or even more gathered here to the offensive of the Oskol River on the Oskol River. However, so far, no particular shifts in the lines have been noticed, and no interesting for no interesting developments have have, have happened. The, the third assault division earned the popular reputation of the kind of fire brigade capable of moving to the most difficult area of any front and fighting the Russians. The mass media had an understandable tendency to perceive the deployment of any unit of the third assault force as a sign of the development of some new events or gains. So, to the south of Borova, in another fierce battle, in a less covered uh, sector, the situation has recently been changing in favor of Ukraine. Appen apparently, months of fighting by the first assault 63rd Mechanized and 12th Azov Brigade on the National Guard, along with their associated units in the dense forest north of Sibirsky Donetsk River, helped to contain the long Russian advance toward Terniv, as a result of which created a breach in the front line. Ukraine is even retaking part of the forest, which is a small part miniature preview of the tactics Ukraine will have to use this fall when it relaunches large-scale attacks. Further south, on the Uglidar front, Moscow advanced by two kilometers over the past few days. The 79th Air Assault and 72nd Mechanized Brigades, along with the Bradley-equipped Skala Battalion and some units of the Territorial Guard, did a tremendous amount of work in this area. But 79th and 72nd Brigades have been serving here for many months and are the furthest from Kyiv logistically, so Moscow likely want to keep the pressure on them to see how depleted they are. The same, of course, is happening on most fronts. The Marine Infantry Bridgehead on the Dnipro River in the Krynki region suffers two to three dozen failed attacks weekly because Moscow has placed most of the Robotinsko-Verbovsky uh, salient, uh, which was formed a year ago, in the Grey Zone and continues to exert pressure further east in the valley of the Mokri Yali River. In the Kharkiv region, although badly hit by the Heimers, the Russians are clinging to their positions and apparently still hoping to break through of chance. But no wonder they're still losing 8,000 people a week. So as we, as we said in our previous podcast, Russians in the last three, four months approximately losing between 30 and 40,000 soldiers. Last week, there was a bit of excitement about the Russian position, which remained largely isolated on the north bank of the Vovchan River, with rumors of hundreds of isolated Russian troops. However, this information cannot be fully confirmed. Ukrainian troops are operating behind them, so their situation cannot be pleasant. Unfortunately, Vavchansk is the gradually disappearing from the map, like all other cities on the front line. At the very least, it serves as a trap for the Russians, who would otherwise ravage some other city in Ukraine. In general, Pokrovska was the most tense area last week. Here, Moscow troops continue its campaign to displace Ukraine to the west of the Vovchani River and group north toward Konstantinovka. I believe that Moscow's goal here is to secure the left bank of the offensive to cut off Taretsk. The Russians are moving on Vazdvizhenka as expected. 
of the 110th Mechanized Brigade and possibly the 100th also stand on their way. To the south of them, Ukrainian troops still hold part of the height west of Vovchaya, uh, and although they are retreating slowly, they're not doing they're not doing so with apparent haste. As the fighting for Chasivyar continues, and Moscow is still unable to break through Ukraine's primary defenses, it appears that what began as an attempt to enter Konstantinivka village is already turning into the attempt to retreat in Taretsk. What happened in Avdeevka? This is what happened in Vadeevka. Moscow's effort in Chasavyar appeared to be shifting southward, which may soon develop into the effort to push the Ukrainian 28th, 22nd and 93rd Mechanized Brigade along with the 5th Assault Brigade of the bridge between Chasavyar and Taretsk. This is consistent with the surprise frontal attacks made in the last few days on Taretsk itself. Moscow managed to advance into the former gray zone quickly and create a, th a threat to advanced Ukrainian positions. This is a very similar to what they tried to do in Avdiivka, even while clearing the flanks at the cost of huge losses. But Avdiivka is more vulnerable than Taretsk. There, Moscow had an advantage in, the, in that the large occupied center Donetsk was only a few minutes drive away. Occupied village Horlivka is much smaller, but is also the last section of the pre-2022 contact line still in Ukrainian hands, likely making it a psychological target for Putin. In essence, the Russian spring-summer 2024 campaign is a giant preemptive pre 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 strike. The strategic goal is to maintain the illusion that the Russian Empire is strong and its victory is inevitable. Dissension among Moscow's enemies is expected to create a window to force them to cease fire before Ukraine's power becomes too powerful to be rolled back. This is pure delay and prey tactics, ironically fueled by the US ongoing obsession with Trump. Putin's intelligence sources are most likely telling him the same thing that the biased media insist, that the election will change everything. It is a convenient narrative, but it's also one that glosses over important tax facts. Neither of these Science encourages an entirely empirical way of thinking, and experts in both understand perfectly well that truth is constructed and determined by perspective in human affairs. This is why Putin invests so much in certain narratives. If you believe that Russia is big and strong and willing to nuke the entire world to get what it wants, then Sacrificing Ukraine seems almost like a responsible move. If instead you accept the empirical evidence that suggests that Putin will manage to carry out exactly one act of nuclear terror, which is likely to be practically pure show before his regime collapses, then his nonsense talk about nuclear weapons and the consequences is pure a theater. Thank you for listening. If you like my podcast, share with your friends.